Okay, welcome to uh, lecture. We'll get started here in just a second. Like usual, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the box below and we'll get your questions answered. We are picking up here it's chapter 11 slash 12 here, some organic chemistry. Uh, again, a reminder that there was a recorded lecture after last week, which was chapter 10 in nuclear chemistry. So if you haven't done so already, make sure that you do look at that and watch it, obviously. All right, so we're into the uh, last week here, and we have, again, a uh, couple of chapters here. We're sort of switching gears, and we're moving into organic chemistry here. So we're just gonna kind of touch upon, uh, chapter 11 is pretty much sort of a, an introduction, if you will, to organic chemistry, uh, followed up by chapter 12, which is a little bit about alkanes, which is sort of our basic uh, organic chemistry type of groups. The good news is uh, not too many calculations, if any. I don't think there's any here, so it's more just kind of like uh, memorization, a little bit of naming and stuff like that uh, as we'll go through it. All right, so we're gonna get started. And again, if you do have any questions, feel free to ask them. So a little bit about introduction to organic chemistry and a reminder that uh, these notes are also found up online if you need them. So basically organic chemistry, uh, you know, usually you'll find in every organic book in that first sentence is basically the study of uh, compounds that contain carbon. So the basis of all organic compounds uh, are carbon-based. And really, as we will see a little bit here, the basis of how they're put together is uh, we have carbons attached to carbons, and usually attached to those carbons are hydrogens. And that's your basic sort of attachment there of organic compounds is carbons to carbons, uh, carbons that have hydrogens attached. And as we'll see a little bit here in these couple of chapters, um, Every so often, some of those hydrogens there will be replaced by some other element. And depending on sort of the other element that replaces the hydrogen, uh, we'll get some different types of organic compounds. Uh, there's different classes of organic compounds, as we'll sort of talk about here. Uh, and what usually determines them, as we will see, is what is known as a functional group. And a functional group is uh, essentially the part of the organic molecule that uh, essentially allows it to be classified a certain way, uh, depending on really a certain type of elements that are there, uh, certain types of bonds that are present. And although they're all organic compounds, there's a lot of different sort of functional groups and sort of classes of organic compounds, a lot of which we'll touch upon here in chapter 11, and then we'll get more specific in a little bit in chapter 12. Now, organic chemicals affect uh, virtually every uh, facet of our life. Um, they're in products uh, such as clothes, foods. Because uh, they are uh, basically carbons and hydrogens as the basis of organic compounds, uh, they obviously are held together by covalent bonding as both co uh, carbon and hydrogen are nonmetals, so they'll be sharing electrons. Uh, so they're much different than sort of inorganic compounds. Um, as well, and obviously different than um, ionic compounds, for example. So organic compounds uh, exist in sort of discrete molecules. These molecules, because they are covalently bonded together, are held together by those intermolecular forces that we've talked about, uh, things like dispersion forces mostly. Uh, again, most organic compounds are gonna be nonpolar for the most part. Uh, there's a, some that can have some polar sides to them, but a lot of them will be nonpolar, which means that a lot of them will use dispersion forces, uh, which are those temporary weak type forces uh, as their main sort of source of intermolecular forces. Remember, intermolecular forces are the forces that hold two molecules together um, in that basic sort of positive negative way. Again, positive side of one molecule attracted to the negative side there of another. And again, intermolecular force, those forces that hold two individual molecules together. Uh, so butane is an organic compound that's a gas. Uh, 
sodium chlorides and ionic compound that is a solid at room temperature. Remember something that's an, uh, an ionic compound is held together by electrostatic attraction. That's that positive negative attraction between the two ions, the positive ion, which is our cation, right? Our negative ion, which is our anion. And this attraction, right, which is that electrostatic attraction, is an intramolecular force, right? So that intramolecular force is means within the molecule. And as we talked about, when we did talk about those intermolecular forces, those forces are much, much stronger than any intermolecular force. So again, that's held together usually more as a solid at room temperature. Now, all organic compounds, basically, again, the basic backbone of an organic compound is carbon. And <clears throat> carbon has sort of a, a property that's important to remember, especially when organic chemistry, and that's that idea that pretty much carbon wants to continue to make bonds until it has four bonds around it. So that's very important. And sometimes when people start drawing organic molecules or so forth, they like to put a ton of bonds around carbon. They'll just keep putting bonds and bonds and bonds on it until it has, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 bonds. And again, that's way, way too many. So carbon uh, will basically, um, basically follow the octet rule, which means it wants eight valence electrons around it. And the basicness of carbon is it essentially wants to continue to bond until it's got those four bonds around it. Hydrogen as well, um, just like in sort of bonding that we talked about, hydrogen can still only have two electrons, which again means we typically will find hydrogen on the outside like we see there in that molecule on the bottom, or what I'm drawing right here. Again, we'll never see again hydrogen in the middle. Uh, just like in normal bonding, it cannot be there. It will have too many bonds to it, too many electrons uh, if that should happen. Now, carbon can form single bonds with other carbons. Uh, they can also form double bonds with other carbons, and they can form triple bonds with other carbons. And that sort of property is also the basis of some different types of organic compounds. So as we will see here, one sort of functional group, if you will, of a, is a carbon-carbon single bond. That's a type of organic compounds, which as we will see are known as alkanes. A carbon-carbon double bond actually changes that organic compound into a type of organic compound, which is known as an alkene, E-N-E. And if you end up with a carbon-carbon triple bond, that also is sort of a functional group. And that will turn that guy into a class of organic compounds, which are known as alkynes. So just by simply adding some extra bonds, if you will, to that carbon-carbon bond, a single bond to a double bond to a triple bond, you actually see what we see on the screen here is basically three different classes of organic compounds. Again, the carbon-carbon single bond, if you have carbon-carbon everywhere around, is what is known as uh, an alkane. If you have at least one carbon-carbon double bond somewhere, they're known as an alkene. And if you have a carbon-carbon triple bond, they're known as an alkyne. Now in terms of, of naming, uh, this here is ethane, as it says on the bottom. This guy here with the double bond is known as really ethene, E-N-E. And this guy with the triple bond is known as ethyne, Y-N-E. And if you look at the end of the name, A-N-E is an alkane. Yeah. E-N-E is an alkene. And Y-N-E is an alkyne. And you can also see that pretty much all three of these names are based off of this first name. And that's also because every single one of them, if you look at them, they both, all three of them have the same number of carbons. And when you sort of name organic compounds, that's really important is basically how many carbons there are. 
and most of all of organic nomenclature or naming all come back to those alkanes. So the guys on the far left there of the screen, those guys with the carbon-carbon single bonds, um, everybody in terms of how their name always comes back to those names. There's some slight variations. As you can see, when you get a double bond, instead of A-N-E at the end, you end up with E-N-E instead of a uh, A-N-E. When you get a triple bond at the far right there, it ends with Y-N-E. You may ask yourself, what, what are about these names? These look different. And one thing about organic chemistry is uh, there's a lot of different names for the same compound. Uh, there's some names that are sort of like the official names, if you will. They're sometimes referred to as the IUPAC name, and that is uh, IUPAC. That's the International Union of Peer and Applied Chemistry. And basically, they're the guys that come up with how you name everything, how you go about naming things. Uh, there's also some historical type names that people sometimes will still use. And there's also sort of common names for the same compound that people will also use as well. So it's not unheard of when you look at a compound to see three different names for the exact same thing. Again, um, sometimes the more official name, a common name, a historical name, for example, uh, to propanol is the same as isopropyl alcohol. It's also the same as what we know as rubbing alcohol. Oops, come back. So all three of those things, although there's sort of three different names, if you will, um, they all basically represent the same thing, none of which is on the screen, by the way. Um, that guy looks something like this here. So that's uh, two propanol, isopropyl alcohol are, again, um, rubbing alcohol. And as you can see, just a kind of a little preview, what makes this an alcohol, for example, is it has an OH group on it. And that's the functional group for an alcohol. So again, just these slight little changes in these sort of compounds uh, basically will give you different organic compounds. Uh, and obviously, they'll have some different properties. So methane uh, is basically your simplest organic compound that you could have. Uh, we've seen it before, that is CH4, and that's the one I just drew, and that was on the other picture there. One carbon, basically four hydrogens attached, is your simplest organic compound there, uh, which is methane. Ethylene, which is that uh, two carbons double bonded, um, kind of a starting material in plastic. Now, some compounds have chains of atoms and some have rings. So sometimes uh, organic molecules are sometimes referred to as being straight chains. And what that essentially means is uh, sort of a straight chain. And essentially, just like what we see here, it is basically just a straight old run of carbons attached to carbons that have hydrogens attached to them. So just a straight old shot of all those guys basically together. Uh, some of them have more of a ring structure. So here all three carbons are pretty much uh, kind of attached to each other. You also sometimes just see this written in line formula as like a triangle, if you will. And line structure, as we'll see, is basically everywhere there's a point or an end of a line, there's a carbon attached as well. They could also, instead of being just straight chains as well, uh, they could also be branched as well. And basically what a branch chain means is you have a run of straight carbons. And every so often there's a sort of branch that comes off with some more carbons and so forth. Again, there would be hydrogens on all these guys. But much like a tree, which is why sometimes they're called branches, uh, branch chains is there's kind of a branch that's off of the main chain, if you will. There's kind of a longest chain and then coming off of it, kind of like a branch on a tree, there's another kind of section of carbons and hydrogens.
So organic uh, compounds uh, usually contain, uh, like I said, basically carbon and hydrogens is sort of the basis of them all. Uh, but again, um, you can uh, swap out some of those hydrogens, if you will, even maybe some of the carbons in some case, and replace them with other atoms. And again, that will give you some different types of organic compounds. Any atom that is not carbon or hydrogen is sometimes called a heteroatom. And uh, common heteroatoms, we have nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. So these are common sort of replacements. Um, they also have some non-bonding electrons. And a lot of them will, again, get to that octet rule uh, sort of surrounding them. And here's a, a table uh, I believe you have in your book as well, or a similar one in your book. Uh, again, some common sort of patterns in terms of bonding that we see in organic compounds. Um, hydrogen, like a normal sort of guy, again, can only have one bond because after he gets that one bond, he maxes out. Remember that hydrogen just needs to get to helium, uh, two electrons to be perfectly happy. And that's why, again, it only has one bond. Our classic thing there really again the basis of organic is our carbon bond there wants to have four bonds nitrogen as well oftentimes nitrogen compounds that are organic are very much like ammonia or they're kind of ammonia based if you will so if you remember ammonia is NH3 and NH3 if you remember does have those non-bonding electrons on the nitrogen so a lot of that is sort of translated into uh, organic guys as well when we get sort of a nitrogen containing group uh, is sort of thought of as being a derivative of ammonia and you'll usually get those non-bonding electrons on the nitrogen as well. Oxygen, that's a very common sort of arrangement for oxygen, uh, that O. We also will see uh, between oxygen and carbon, a very common bond that also occurs is this one here. This is what is sometimes referred to as a carbonyl. And that's basically your carbon oxygen double bond that occurs. And that's also super common uh, when we see organic compounds. And also the oxygen that we see here in this table and this arrangement also very, very common. We actually just saw it in the alcohol is a very common, again, arrangement of that. I missed there with the dots, but I go see the oxygen. <laughs> Um, so that's again a very, very common sort of arrangement for oxygen that we see in organic guys. Our halogens are group seven, uh, pretty much kind of like normal. They just kind of fill it out. So similar to maybe what we drove uh, when you did basic Lewis structures, uh, they will have that octet rule and they usually will end up with one bond and basically uh, two, four, six non-bonding electrons around it or three lone pairs around it uh, like we see here. So that's again a common arrangement that we see uh, for our halogens. Again, as I just uh, sort of drew there, uh, the common arrangement that we do see for oxygen uh, when attached to a carbon. Again, that OH group is super common. It's a whole class of, of compounds as we just saw. Again, the OH group being there is the functional group for an alcohol. And you might even notice the name here, alcohols end in OL. This compound here is what is known as methanol, which surprisingly enough, or maybe not surprisingly enough, also ends in OL. So you can maybe see sort of a pattern developing here. The name of the functional group or the organic group uh, usually is how the guy will end when you go to name it. And also here, if you sort of tie it together to our alkane, this has one carbon and one carbon. The basis of one carbon is that alkane, which is methane. A-N-E, because it's an alkane, we kind of drop that last little part of it and replace it with an O-L, and methane becomes methanol O-L, again, because it has that alcohol functional group attached to it. This is formaldehyde, and this is also a, a type of organic compound. Uh, this has a functional group of this, 
And this functional group is for a group of compounds known as an aldehyde. And an aldehyde, um, again, will always have that functional group. So if you just kind of box it here, there's that functional group there, the carbon oxygen double bond uh, with the hydrogen that is there. This is uh, formaldehyde. Uh, that's a common name for it. The, the IUPAC name is what is known as methanol AL. Not to be confused with methanol OL over here. Uh, but methanol is a formal way of naming an aldehyde. And you might also notice it also contains one carbon, also based off of methane here. Again, drop that little last part of methane and put AL at it, it actually becomes methanol. And again, formaldehyde is more of a common name for it, but they both actually do refer to the exact same compound. This guy here, the methanol, would be the more IUPAC way of naming, which is again, sort of the more official way of naming something. Um, but again, very, very common in organic chemistry. You still see common names, historical names sort of used as well. And that makes it sometimes a little bit more confusing for people because um, they're like talking about the same thing, even though it's got three different names, but it is the same thing. So again, um, You'll, you'll oftentimes come across those multiple names. Now there's different ways to sort of draw uh, organic sort of structures, if you will. Um, and come back here. Uh, one is a condensed structure. And in a condensed structure, uh, all the atoms are drawn in, but uh, basically we, we don't show sort of the lone pairs or any dots or anything like that. And we also um, won't draw out basically uh, the hydrogens. So when we see two structures here, really, uh, these are two different ways to represent the same thing. This is what is sometimes called the expanded structural formula. And basically in the expanded structural formula, we pretty much draw out everything. So we draw out the hydrogens, you know, just like you would kind of do in Lewis structures. I will say a lot of times though, things like non-bonding electrons, especially on a lot of them are, are sort of omitted, um, but they are still assumed to be there. Um, this over here is really a condensed formula here. And sometimes the condensed formula will be just like this, where it's just all kind of lined up together. A lot of times though, people will still sort of put the little dash in between everybody, kind of like this. And this is also a condensed formula. And sometimes people used to years ago call it a structural condensed formula because they had the little dashes. Uh, but the connection here is what we see here. It is again, the carbons to the carbons, even though in the condensed formula, the H's are kind of in between. The structural is still carbons attached to carbons and the hydrogens attached to the carbons. And again, CH3 is basically this right here. Then we have a CH2, a CH2, and again, another CH3 here at the end. So that is uh, two different ways that you could sort of represent an organic sort of compound. Uh, again, on the left, really more of an expanded structural formula. On the right there is, again, the condensed formula. And really the main difference usually is just that uh, in the condensed formula, we really don't draw out the bonds to the hydrogens, just kind of put them together. And sort of a uh, third way is something that looks like this. This is a line structure. And this line structure basically represents what we see here on the screen. Again, everywhere there is an end to the line, everywhere there is sort of a, uh, where two guys come together, those are carbons. So again, right here would be a carbon, this would be a carbon, this would be a carbon, and right there would be a carbon. And again, uh, in line structure, it's just kind of a clean structure. We don't really put anything else in there unless there's something attached. It's also assumed that because each of these guys here are carbons, that each carbon again is going to want four bonds. So attached to each of those carbons, uh, we will see the correct number of hydrogens to get us to four.
So this guy technically would have three hydrogens at the end, and that would be this guy right here. This guy here would have two hydrogens as it has two lines coming in, which would be this guy. This guy also has two lines coming in, so he needs two hydrogens there to get to four, which would be this guy here. And the guy at the end has only one line coming in, which means he needs three hydrogens there to get the four. And that would represent this guy here. Again, in line structure though, we don't usually draw the hydrogens in, we don't usually draw the carbons in. We essentially just kind of do this zigzag shape um, that we typically see. Any questions on that there? Now, even in sort of condensed formula, if we have more of a branch sort of chain that's occurring, uh, we also do sort of include that as well. So we usually will distinguish something here, like this guy right here, which is CH3, is not part of the big chain that's over here. So to distinguish that bond, we would kind of draw the line in in the condensed structure as well. Uh, if we were doing our line structure, it would look something like this. And then it actually would just be a line that goes straight up. And again, nothing at the end of the line would indicate that there's a carbon there. And again, it has one bond, which means it should have three hydrogens attached to get it to four. So again, sometimes even a line structure, people look at it and go, I have a line, but there's nothing attached there. What is that? Again, it's just a carbon at the end with three hydrogens. If they wanted something there, if you're drawing a line structure, for example, they would actually put it in if it wasn't that and try not to miss it. But, you know, for example, if they did that, then that obviously is a bromine attached at the end of it. Um, but again, the guy on the bottom here, which kind of looks very similar with nothing written there, it's again assumed that it is that carbon with those four or uh, three hydrogens attached. Now, sometimes uh, we do get into a lot of sort of repeated patterns are repeated sort of groups that occur uh, and sometimes just to save space especially if there's a lot of repeated patterns uh, people will sometimes put parentheses around in the condensed structure uh, to indicate that you have sort of that group that just kind of repeats uh, so that's what we see here this is basically one two three four carbons in a row but right there, sort of in the middle, we have this small little repeating pattern of CH2 followed by another CH2. So sometimes people will put the CH2 in parentheses and the number next to it to indicate how many of those repeatable patterns that we see. Uh, if you do see it sort of written like that, you wanna make sure if you are counting carbons that you don't miss them. So sometimes people, when they see that formula written like that, will go, oh, it only has one, two, three carbons. Uh, because again, they missed that sort of repeated pattern, but it actually does have four. So it's important to make sure you look at that. So when we draw skeletal structure, which is again, sometimes also referred to as sort of line structure, if you will. We assume, again, there's a carbon atom at any junction uh, between two lines and at the end of the line. And in basic sort of organic chemistry, when you're drawing sort of things and you want to fill it out, if you've already put in all the carbons and all sort of the other elements, uh, what you're left with at that point essentially is just hydrogen. So you use hydrogens really to get you to the magic number for carbon, which is four bonds. So much like I did earlier, um, Again, if we had something like this, this again is one carbon here, two carbons there, three carbons here, four carbons here, and five carbons here. Again, um, if we look at, say, the carbon up on top, we have two lines coming in. And again, to get us to four, there technically would be two hydrogens attached there. There would also be two hydrogens attached here. The guy at the end has only one line coming in, which means to get the four, they need three hydrogens. Same thing on this side, would need three hydrogens as well. And again, usually in line structure, we don't include anything other than that 
We also do see this typical, what is sometimes referred to as a zigzag shape. And that's really because when we do look at something like this, for example, we'll just look at the end part of it. So if we just look at this guy right here, that guy has four electron pairs. It also has four bonds. And if you remember from uh, molecular geometry, something with four electron pairs and four bonds is your tetrahedral geometry. And that's a bond angle 109.5 degrees. And again, because each of those pretty much has that tetrahedral arrangement, it ends up becoming sort of this zigzag shape that you commonly will see. Uh, it sort of looks just like mountains, if you will, when you kind of draw Lewis structures, or, or, or not Lewis structures, when you draw these line structures together, uh, you just kind of have these peaks that kind of keep happening. And again, technically, it's because of the geometry that's occurring at those carbons. Because they're all single bonded and carbon has basically four bonds and four electron pairs, again, it will all basically result in a tetrahedral geometry. Again, uh, line structure is essentially a very sort of clean way, I guess, if you want to look at it, to draw something here on the left and on the right are the exact same thing here. This is just a ring structure on the right drawn uh, as sort of a line structure. And this is typically how it's drawn here on the right, but just to show and emphasize everywhere sort of the car lines come together. It's assumed to be a carbon. So that's how we get our, you know, six carbons that we see over here on the left. And again, each of these carbons in this particular case has two lines coming in. And again, to give everybody in terms of carbon four bonds, it would need, each of those guys would need two hydrogens. So again, that's how we get to our structure there on the left and our structure on the right, which is the same. And again, as you can see, this is also why hydrogens and carbons aren't written into these structures. As you can see, it gets really crowded. And as opposed, people oftentimes will just use these line structures as just a, again, a more cleaner way uh, to represent these sort of molecules. Here's again another couple ones. These are cyclopentanol. OL is an alcohol, as you can maybe see, as we talked a little bit about before. It has this OH group that makes it an alcohol. And one, two, three, four, five carbons is based off of pentane, and it's an alcohol, it's pentanol, and cyclopentanol because it's a ring structure. So again, this part of it over here is all of our carbons and hydrogens together, which is equivalent to what we see here. And then obviously this OH group here is this guy over here. You know? And you can also see that also for simplicity, a lot of times sort of an organic chemistry, even though that oxygen there does have the two non-bonding electron pairs, sometimes it is sort of emitted a lot of times in organic chemistry. Again, because there's a lot of, uh, sort of uh, atoms and stuff like that. So for just clarity, sometimes it is emitted, but sometimes it is also included as well, so. So as we sort of alluded to here, and as we've been talking about, a functional group is really the part of an organic compound that basically allows it to be classified as a certain type of organic compound. And a lot of guys that have obviously the same functional group are basically uh, combined together and they basically will share a lot of similar physical and chemical properties just basically based on that functional group. Another sort of way that we sometimes see things in organic chemistry is a lot of times in sort of formulas, you'll see this R. So for example, you may see like RH. And basically, this represents a couple of things. The OH part here would be our functional group. And as I talked about here a couple of times, that is the functional group for an alcohol. 
And this R part that you'll sometimes see there is sort of a generic way in organic chemistry that we represent basically a carbon group. Um, so this basically represents like a bunch of carbons that are attached, you know, with some hydrogens. Could be one carbon with some hydrogens, could be two carbons with some hydrogens, could be like I got here, three carbons with some hydrogens. It's basically just a generic way that uh, it's a carbon containing group. And that is basically what the R will stand for. So again, sometimes that will pop up in organic chemistry. You'll see these formulas and they're like R or something. Uh, and again, that R is just to represent that there's some type of carbon containing group attached uh, there. So let's talk about some of these functional groups in some different classes of organic uh, compounds. And some of which we touched a little bit upon here and we'll see sort of the functional groups again as we go through it. Uh, but the first thing, sometimes we refer to uh, some organic compounds as hydrocarbons. And hydrocarbons, pretty much uh, like the name implies, is basically a group of carbons attached to carbons and hydrogens attached to those carbons. So a hydrocarbon contains only carbons and hydrogens. And again, that is just something like this, where we got those carbons attached to carbons. And again, attached to these carbons are hydrogens. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, sometimes this is sort of how we get to these different organic groups. We replace some of those hydrogens with some other elements and we get different sort of groups. But within sort of a hydrocarbons, uh, these sort of functional groups here are guys that basically just contains carbons and hydrogens. So as I mentioned before, alkanes, the functional group is the carbon-carbon single bond. And those are your basic organic molecules, yeah, are your alkanes. And these are all guys that have carbon-carbon single bonds, uh, no double bonds anywhere, no triple bonds, nothing like that. Just simply, much like what I drew there on the top left, carbons attached to carbons via single bonds and hydrogens attached there as well. They're super important because as I mentioned, every single organic compound, depending on its functional group, whatever its functional group may be, they all come back to the alkanes in terms of naming and sort of their function. So everything is sort of based on alkanes. They're sort of the basis of organic molecules. And again, they're sort of the simplest organic molecules you can have, which again are carbon-carbon single bonds. Now, if you happen to put in again, as I mentioned earlier, at least one double bond into the fray, that is where you get this group of organic compounds, which are alkenes, E-N-E. And that is something that has at least one double bond in it. Could have more than one, but at least has to have one double bond. And that is a group of organic compounds known as alkenes. Now, if you get to your triple bond, that is another type of organic molecule where the functional group is a triple bond. And those are groups which are known as alkynes, Y-N-E. And that's similar to what we saw earlier in that earlier slide. We had ethane, which was our carbon-carbon single bond. We had ethene, which had a double bond. And we had ethine, which had a triple bond. So ethane would look like this. Again, carbon-carbon single bond. Ethene would have a double bond. Like this. And ethine would have a triple bond like this. You may also notice something that's also important when you sort of draw these things or think about these things in terms of... Uh, what's happening with our hydrogen, for example. When we go from a single bond to a double bond, for example, we actually lose two hydrogens, right? 
And that is because if we took our, our alkane, which is ethane here, and we decided we wanted to make it a double bond and we just put the double bond in, it violates pretty much what we talked about with bonding, which is the octet rule, right? And if we look at the carbon on either side in this case, the carbon on either side now has, for example, this guy, one, two, three, four, five bonds, which would be 10 electron pairs. That is way too many. That's eight is what we're looking for, right? Guy on the right-hand side as well is, if you count it, it will also have one, two, three, four, five bonds are 10 electron pairs. So remember, octet rule means we could only have eight. So in order to make room for that double bond to come in, we actually lose one hydrogen and two hydrogens. And when we lose those two hydrogens, what you're left with now you can see is one, two, three, four bonds on the carbon on the left, four bonds carbon on the right. They both have eight valence electrons and they're perfectly happy with octet rule. We also see that occur as we come down from a double bond into a triple bond as we go from a double bond into a triple bond say from here to here we also lose for example another two hydrogens to allow us to have enough room there to make that triple bond so typically in organic chemistry every time you make a, another bond between a carbon and a carbon it usually results in a cup of hydrogen disappearing if you will and obviously if you kind of take away a bond, you actually need to replace them with a couple of hydrogens. Any questions on that there? Now, there's also a, a group of compounds that are organic compounds, which are known as aromatics. And aromatics are basically will contain what is referred to as a benzene ring. And benzene looks something like this. So benzene looks like looks something like this, or it may look something like this. Or in organic chemistry, sometimes people will just draw benzene like this. Very badly drawn, let's try that again there. A little circle around it. And basically what benzene is, is six carbons and three double bonds. So benzene is really uh, C6, H6. And that's because of these double bonds that are here. There's a carbon here and it would only have one hydrogen. This carbon has three lines coming in, it would have one hydrogen, three coming in, it would have just one hydrogen, one hydrogen there, one there, and one there. And these are known as resonance structures of each other, the, the two on top there. Um, and again, a resin structure is where you can basically move around the double bonds and put them in different locations. And um, it's basically the same molecule. And that's why also as well in organic chemistry, sometimes a lot of times people draw the benzene ring kind of like what I did there on the bottom. Let me try a better drawing here see if I proved it a little bit. Not bad, that kind of looks like a G now. Let me fix that. Hang on here. with the old college try here and try to see if I can get a circle in there. Let's see. Not bad. All right. And sometimes they'll put that circle in there to imply that, uh, again, those double bond electrons uh, could either be double bonded like it is on the left over here. Or they may be sort of in the opposite location like they are here on the right. So sometimes you'll sometimes see that a lot, this kind of circle in the middle. Uh, because those double bond electrons are what are known as being delocalized, so they're moving around and they could be in any position at any given time. So alkanes, uh, functional group, carbon-carbon single bond. Alkenes, functional group, carbon-carbon double bond. Alkynes, functional group, carbon-carbon triple bond. And again, something that's classified as an aromatic organic group will have that benzene ring as part of it. Here's a table, and again, I think you have a similar table in your book. But uh, our functional group here, carbon, carbon, single bond, double bond, triple bond, a much prettier benzene ring drawn here. Uh, but again, it has those three uh, double bonds in it. And again, those six carbons. 
here's a few more uh, organic type groups that we'll talk a little bit about, but these are some of the functional groups. Uh, an alkyl halide is basically a carbon containing group. So remember that's basically carbon that has a halogen attached to it. And that's why I sometimes refer to it as an alkyl halide. Alkyl means basically a carbon containing group. Halide basically means it's a halogen that's attached there. An alcohol, as we saw, a functional group for an alcohol. Uh, is that OH? So our functional group, as we saw, is that OH? Uh, our ether has a functional group of kind of carbon, oxygen, carbon with the oxygen between two carbons. And that's a class of an ether. And as you can see here, this is what is known as dimethyl ether. An amine is a guy that has a functional group that has really a, an ammonia type of guy. So that's our nitrogen there with our, our electrons on the nitrogen. Again, an ammonia-based type group. A thiol, the functional group, is that uh, sulfur-containing group, so SH. But it has that sulfur in it, uh, which is what makes it a thiol. So again, each of these really are based off of the alkanes, which is again, really your, your basic building blocks of all organic sort of molecules. Uh, but they all have these slightly different components attached. And again, these slightly different components are those functional groups. And because of these different little sort of functional groups that are attached, uh, we do get things that have different properties um, based on the functional groups that are attached. And, um, you know, they're slightly different in terms of their characteristics. And that's why, again, they're classified a little bit differently. Um, but they're all really based off of uh, sort of those alkanes uh, in, in their basic structure. So as I mentioned earlier as well, there's a lot of organic groups that contain this sort of uh, group in it. And this is what is known as a carbonyl group. And again, basically the carbonyl group is this guy here. It's that carbon oxygen double bond. This is what is sometimes referred to as the carbonyl carbon. And the carbonyl group is that basic carbon oxygen double bond. Here again, sometimes and a lot of times people will sometimes omit these guys, um, but you should put them in. But if you do see this, it is implied a lot of times, especially in organic chemistry, that you know those dots are there. But sometimes it is omitted uh, in sometimes pictures. So there's kind of a few different uh, organic compounds that have that carbonyl group as part of its functional group. So we saw this guy a little bit earlier. An aldehyde, its functional group is the carbon-oxygen double bond with a hydrogen at the end. And here again is where we see that. That is the functional group there of an aldehyde. A ketone has basically a three-carbon run. So if you need a ketone, you need three carbons in a row. And usually right there in the middle carbon, you have that carbon oxygen double bond or the carbonyl group. And again, you can see here, here's one, two, three carbons in a row with our double bond happening on that center carbon, if you will. Now, ketones can have more than three carbons, but the functional group part of it is where you could count off basically three carbons in a row that have that. So for example, just so you don't think that it's always three carbons for a ketone, for example, this right here so this is a ketone as well obviously you can see it has more than three carbons but the way again you could sort of recognize it is if you look here right in the center there's one carbon two carbons and three carbons in a row and in the middle of that three carbons in a row uh, is where you find that carbon oxygen double bond, which makes it a ketone. So again, that three carbons in a row doesn't imply that it only has three carbons, 
but somewhere within that molecule, you will be able to see those three carbons in a row with the carbon oxygen double bond sort of in the middle of those three carbons. Here's a couple of other groups that have those carbonyl uh, carbons attached. And again, uh, carboxylic acid uh, has the functional group that looks like this. Actually has a couple of these guys here. It's got the OH in it and it's got that carbonyl carbon. In general, these are sometimes uh, guys that you'll see written like this in formulas. So if you see COOH, it represents this here. So very common sometimes with these guys, they'll, people abbreviate it even more as just that COOH. And again, it really does represent the uh, drawn out group there on the left. Our ester also has it and the functional group of an ester is a carbon, carbon with a double bond. And a little bit different than a ketone, it actually has an oxygen attached there. Uh, and that's also attached to a carbon. So it's got that kind of oxygen in the way is an ester. And um, so similar to a ketone, except it doesn't have that three carbons in a row. It's kind of broken up by that oxygen that's there. And another one that has that carbon oxygen double bond that actually has like the nitrogen attached to it. This is known as an amid and an amid's functional group also kind of looks similar to a, a carboxylic acid, except that it has a carbon oxygen double bond. It also had nitrogen containing group, uh, similar to what you find in an amine that we saw earlier that had that NH3 type of group on it or NH2 group. And putting both of those things together gives us an amid. So again, you can see by having some type of functional group there, it does change the type of organic molecule that you have. And again, it will give it some different properties as well. All right, so let's talk a little bit about alkanes a little bit closer here. And we're gonna talk uh, a little bit about alkanes. We're gonna talk a little bit about how to name alkanes. And Alkanes are, again, sort of your simplest organic molecules that you can have. Again, the functional group for an alkane is essentially the carbon-carbon single bond. So all alkanes have only those guys. They have basically only carbons and attached to carbons and hydrogens sort of attached to those carbons in most cases. And again, those carbon-carbon bonds, which is important, are only going to be single bonds. So alkanes are hydrocarbons that contain those carbon-carbon single bonds and the carbon-hydrogen single bond. Now, alkanes that have uh, contains chains of carbons but no rings, they're called acyclic alkanes. And they're basically straight chain alkanes. Those are basically the guys who just kind of run together. And alkanes have this general formula of CnH2n plus 2. And n is basically the number of carbons. So if you have one carbon, 2 times 1 is 2 plus 2 means you should have four hydrogens. And that is what is known as methane, A-N-E. If you have two carbons, n would equal 2. So 2 times 2 is 4 plus 2 would give you six hydrogens, and that is what is known as ethane. If you have three carbons, three times two is six, plus two is eight. That is what is known as propane. Four carbons would give you four times two is eight, plus two is 10. That is what is known as butane. Five carbons, would give you five times two is 10 plus two more gives you 12. This is what is known as pentane. Six carbons gives you 14 hydrogens. That is known as hexane. Might as well finish out the first 10 here. Uh, seven carbons would get you 16 hydrogens. That is what is known as heptane. Eight gets you 18. That is what is known as octane. 
Nine carbons would get you 20 hydrogens. That is what is known as no name. And 10 carbons would get you 22 hydrogens. That is what is known as decane. We'll see probably a much prettier picture here of that in just a second. Uh, but these are the first 10 alkanes. And these are super important. Because pretty much if you do anything with organic chemistry, every single thing that you name along the way or try to name, they will all pretty much come back to these first 10 names. So it's really important, especially with sort of uh, learning to name some of these guys, to learn these first 10 names, know the formula for them, uh, again, because that's going to be helpful in you being able to uh, sort of properly name these. These are all alkanes, A-N-E, and you can see that they all end in A-N-E all the way down, propane, butane, pentane, A-N-E, hexane, and so forth. So when we do have uh, alkanes, again, they're all single bonded. They all have this general formula of for every carbon you add, you know, two times the carbon plus two more. Acyclic alkanes are saturated alkanes. So what is a saturated alkane or a saturated hydrocarbon is sometimes referred to. Saturated essentially means that they have the maximum number of hydrogens that they could have based on the number of carbons that are there. So what that means is, for example, if we look at a couple of things that we saw earlier, if we look at ethane that we saw earlier, which again is our two carbons, And just like we saw there, two carbons, two times two is four, plus two more gives us six hydrogens, which we see here. This is what is known as a saturated hydrocarbon, really. And what I just wrote into as well here, this guy is a saturated hydrocarbon. It has the maximum number of hydrogens that you should have when you have two carbons. So in this case, when you have two carbons, you should have six hydrogens to max out basically the number of hydrogens. Now, an unsaturated hydrocarbon, hydrocarbon is when you don't have that. So for example, we also saw this guy. When we put in that double bond to make it an alkene, we now had to lose, if you remember, a couple of hydrogens to allow for that bond to occur. And because we lost those two hydrogens to make that bond, we now don't have the maximum number of hydrogens we should have. As we see above, we should have six if we saturated everybody. And in this case, because we have a double bond here, we only have four hydrogens. And this is what is sometimes referred to as an unsaturated hydrocarbon. So usually an unsaturated hydrocarbon will have at least one double bond, maybe a triple bond, something like that, which essentially will allow you not to hit really your maximum number of hydrogens. So alkanes are essentially usually saturated. Again, they usually will have saturated hydrocarbons will have that maximum number of hydrogens that you should have. Now, Cycloalkanes are also alkanes. They are also means that they have all single bonds, but the cyclo part of it means basically it's a ring type structure. So what that means is basically if you think about it, if you take like the end of like a straight chain, so you have all these carbons that run together or just straight across or whatever. And if you take the end of both of them and kind of put them together, you're going to close that ring into a ring structure, and that's what's known as a cycloalkane. Now, cycloalkanes have a general form of CNH2N, and this is for this reason. So, for example, if we look at just an alkane that has three carbons, which as we just learned there are three carbons, that is going to be propane. 
So that's propane. And again, that's just an alkane, not a cycloalkane. It's a straight chain there. It's, an un, it's a saturated hydrocarbon. But now if we wanna kinda like join these guys together, so for example, if we wanted to take both ends basically, so if we wanted to take this guy here and this guy here and basically join them together by making a bond. And if I just draw that bond in there in the blue, very badly done, right? And if I wanted to kind of close that in, I'm going to run into the exact same situation that we had when we try to put a double bond in or we try to put a triple bond in, right? If I look at the carbon on the left and if I imaginary drew that really bad blue line there, that technically would be a bond. So that would be one, two, three, four, and five bonds that would be attached to that carbon on the left if I just drew a line to it. And the same thing would happen with the carbon on the right. If you looked around it, it would then have five bonds. So the problem with that, again, is the basic of really the octet rule, right? It's the octet rule, which means it could only have eight valence electrons. And remember, carbon pretty much wants four bonds, right? So when we take the ends of both of these, uh, of the molecules such as this, and we wanna put it into a ring structure, basically the same thing has to occur. We have to lose two hydrogens. So when we do that, we actually would lose two hydrogens and those carbons would end up in this shape right here, which is like a triangle. And usually cycloalkanes are drawn like this in line structure where you just kind of see these geometrical shapes. And remember that it essentially means we have a carbon, carbon, carbon. And each of these carbons have two lines coming in, which means each of them have two hydrogens. So if we count up what we got here, we actually have C3H6. There's six hydrogens as opposed to what we started with in the alkane, just a straight chain, there is three carbons and eight hydrogens. So here we lose two hydrogens when we basically put that guy into a ring structure. And that's why cycloalkanes will have this general structure formula, CnH times N. So if we look at our three carbons, three carbons, Three times two is six hydrogens, yes, which is what we end up with over here. Same thing here, if we look here, we have six carbons. Six times two is 12 hydrogens. Again, at each of these carbons, there's two lines coming in, which means each of these would have two hydrogens happening. Now, in terms of names of these sort of guys, uh, again, everything is based off of those alkane names. So when we look at something with three carbons, that's an alkane, it is known as propane. When we still have one, two, and three carbons together, it is still propane. But again here, the arrangement is a ring structure, so we put cyclo in front of it. So this is what is known as cyclopropane, the triangle. It has three carbons in a ring structure, and it would be known as cyclopropane. This guy here that I uh, sort of uh, drew all the hydrogens in. This guy here, again, we'll just redraw it over here maybe. This guy, if we count it again, as we see, has six carbons. Six carbons straight across is what is known as hexane. So if you look back at our six carbons right here, just straight six carbons attached to each other with hydrogens attached to those, those are gonna be hexane. But because this is a ring structure, this becomes what is known as cyclohexane. All one word, I kind of missed it there, but that's all one word, cyclohexane. And 
That is not to be confused with something else that we saw that looks very similar to it. So you may be saying to yourself, that looks very much like perhaps benzene. And the answer is they are not the same. So cyclohexane, which is this guy, is all carbon-carbon single bonds, no double bonds to be found. Benzene that we saw earlier, also this six carbon ring, but it has those double bonds inside, right? So again, this is benzene. This is not benzene, yeah? So exit out a few times. That is not benzene. Again, benzene does need to have those three double bonds drawn like I just did there, or again with that circle in it. If you see a six-membered ring like we do here on the left and we did in the picture in the middle, again, with no double bonds in it, it is cyclohexane and again, not benzene. So that's a very common sort of mistake some people make. They just see that structure and go, oh, I think it's benzene. But they definitely will put the double bonds in there, the circle in there, if they are talking about benzene. Any questions on that there? All right, so we uh, sort of covered some of these here, but again, very important to know these first 10 alkanes as everything is essentially based off of them. And again, it's determined by the IUPAC, which is something that you hear a lot in organic chemistry. And as I mentioned before, that is the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. Again, those are like the three guys you could think for how do you come yes and name everything all kinds of weird ways. They basically come up with all the nomenclature that you see, uh, the elements that you see on the periodic table, you know, they decide and all those kind of things. So uh, again, these are all alkanes. So the connection and all of these guys here, for example, here, again, if you drew it out in that expanded structural formula, it is the hydrogens attached to the carbons the carbons attached to each other. And again, this is the connection that we see here in all organic guys. It looks just like that. So what we have here on the right is more of a condensed formula, even though they say structural formula, but these are really a uh, condensed formula. Put condensed on it. This is what we have sort of over there. And again, they all end in A and E because they're alkane. So we have our methane, which is our simplest, our ethane, our propane, our butane, and our pentane. Uh, so basically meth one, eth two, prop three, bute four, and pent is five. And a little bit about some of these uh, here is methane. Uh, again, is the simplest, simplest organic molecule you can have. It is essentially just one carbon with four hydrogens attached. It is like the stuff that comes out when you light a Bunsen burner. A lot of the several first several uh, alkanes are very flammable. You have methane, butane, propane, right? These are all things that are very, very flammable. And here's our, our methane general structure. And again, basically these alkanes will have those four electron pairs and those four bonds. So they're all gonna get that tetrahedral arrangement, which again gives it that 109.5 bond angle. And as we talked about earlier, when you get a bunch of those kind of carbons together, that is what is really responsible for that zigzag shape that we commonly will see alkane sort of drawn in. Ethane again is our two carbon guy where each of these carbons have the tetrahedral arrangement. Again, they each have that uh, 109.5 arrangement, four electron pairs, four bonds, and you can start to see that zigzag shape starting to develop here as we build on more carbons. Here's our propane, and again, that zigzag shape, each of these carbons have four bonds. Um, again, three hydrogens at the end, the guy in the middle has the two, and you can see because of the geometry of each of these guys, that is where that zigzag shape is really starting to form here in our alkanes. So again, this would be more the condensed structure. This would be more the structural formula. And obviously these are some 3D representations, uh, lines basically coming out of the screen, 
wedges going backwards or sometimes used to represent three dimension. Now these are propanes and these are both basically propane and something that comes up in organic chemistry and we'll maybe touch upon a little bit here in these chapters. Uh, these are sometimes referred to, these are not, but these sometimes where people get confused is what is uh, sometimes referred to as an isomer. And an isomer, as we'll talk about, I think just a little bit here in this chapter, uh, an isomer is basically the same molecular formula, uh, but it is two different compounds. And sometimes people, when they go to draw, for example, something like an isomer, is they think, well, if I just draw it where I just maybe tilt down the end of it. So that's kind of what you got going on here in the picture that we're looking at. That is two different things. And one way that you can basically determine whether or not, for example, you drew an isomer or you didn't draw an isomer, are, are these things the same thing? Are they different things? One very easy way to do that is through sort of naming them. So what you want to do is sort of uh, name each of the pictures that you draw. And if you happen to come up with the same name, they are not different compounds. They're actually the same molecule. If you do come up with two distinct names, if you go to name them, then you actually do have something that's an isomer. So again, an isomer is basically the same molecular formula. It has some type of different connectivity, which makes it a different compound, and they are different things. But when you have basically the same thing, uh, when you name them, they're obviously not isomers. The basis of all the ways that you name things in organic chemistry, the basic thing that you always look for when you start to name something is you look for the longest continuous carbon chain. And what that means is when you look at your structure that's drawn, you want to count up how many carbons there are in a row. And when you're counting these carbons in a row, they don't always have to be straight. They don't have to be straight. They could go up, they could go down. But the important part is when you're counting them, the one thing that you can't do is backtrack. So for example, when you go to count things, you know, you're going this way, one, two, three, four, five, and maybe there's one down here. So you can't go one, two, three, four, five, and go backwards, six, seven. You have to go in one direction until you hit a dead end. So you could go that way, you could come down until you hit a dead end. But you just can't backtrack, basically, when you're trying to find the longest carbon chain. So if we start here on the left, that is one carbon, two carbons, three carbons. And that's three carbons with nothing else attached but hydrogens, and three carbons with nothing else attached, as the name implies, is propane. Now, you may look at this structure over here and go, that is like totally a completely different structure, right? It's like things coming down, right? The other one's straight. Clearly, this has to be a different molecule altogether, right? Because it doesn't maybe look like it. But if you were to do that same approach where you would count the longest continuous carbon chain, this would be one, this would be two, and then you just drop down. That would be three, right? So no dead end. You hit a dead end. You didn't go backwards. This also still has only three carbons and nails attached. So this is also propane. So both of these are just two different ways that you drew propane. Our propane was drawn and they are the same. So you could draw it like that. You could draw it straight on the left. You could draw it down. These both on the screen here are not isomers. So these are not isomers on the screen. These are not isomers. So for example, though, if I took say, If I took this guy here, let me draw this. And if I drew this, 
And if I drew this, So these are three differently drawn sort of structures. And what we wanna look at is, are they the same or are they different? So let's just start with the top one, pretty straightforward. Again, we're just gonna look for the longest continuous carbon chain in a row. So one, two, three, and four, everything else is high. So four carbons in a row is butane. Now, when you look at the structure below it that I drew. Again, it may look different, but if I were to count the longest continuous carbon chain, this would be one, two, three, and then I would come down. That would also be four. Nothing else attached is different. They're all hydrogens. This also would be butane, yeah? So this structure up on top and this structure right here, they are the same. Again, just a different way to draw them. Now let's look at the third structure that I drew. And the third structure that I drew, let's count the longest continuous carbon chain. So we got one, two, and three, right? So that's one way you could do it. Again, you can't go backwards, so you gotta go one way until you hit a dead end, which I did at three. Let's see, but we do have a couple other options. So let's see if anything's different. So let's go this way. So I'm gonna start here on the left and I'll just re go as red. So one, two, and then I could go up, which would also be three. So no matter which way I go in this very last structure that I drew, <clears throat> this very last structure that I drew, the, the most carbons that you could get in a row without backtracking or anything like that is only three. And three carbons, if you remember, is based off of what we have right here it is propane, yeah? And if I redraw that maybe a little neater, so it'd be a little bit easier to see, go this way. If I just put a box around these three guys here, that's my three carbons in a row, which gives us propane. It also has this little group attached here. This is what is known as a methyl group. And this would be what is known as two methyl propane. All one word, again, they all got slipped there, a little space. There you go. So two methyl propane would be the name of this guy. And we could clearly see that we now have something that has a different name. And because it has a different name, it has a different amount of carbons in a row. It is actually a different compound. So again, 2-methylpropane. So this guy here, and any one of these guys up here, your choice, this guy or to this guy, these are not the same thing, but these are actually what are known as, again, an isomer of each other. And they're isomers of each other because if you count up just the basics of what's there, if we look at butane up here, there are four carbons and there are 10 hydrogens. If we look at two methyl propane down here, there are four carbons. And there's three, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 hydrogens. They both have the identical molecular formula and something again with an identical molecular formula, but different arrangement. Those are what are known as isomers. So the third structure and either the first structure or the second structure, they're what are known as isomers of each other. They have the same formula, but different connectivity. They also would have different properties, and as you can see, different names. When we look at the first two structures on the right there that were drawn, they, even though they may look different when you go to name them, they both have the exact same name. 
and they are basically the exact same compound, just drawn slightly different. Any questions on that there? Now for the rest of sort of this chapter, which is we're kind of, I think, blended into right now, chapter 12, really. We kind of finished chapter 11. We're blending into really chapter 12 here. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna talk about how to name some of these guys, obviously next time and all that good stuff. And uh, that will be it, I think. So uh, for right now, I think we will stop here. We will finish up the rest of this chapter on Wednesday, which will be our very last lecture, I believe. And then if I'm not mistaken, I believe our final exam is one week from today, I believe. Uh, so one week from today, we will take the final and then that's all she wrote, I think, on that deal. Um, any questions on anything like that? Your exam scores will be up in the next day or so, maybe later today or so and stuff like that. So uh, those will be up very shortly. A reminder that the final exam, uh, I'll look and see what I have in terms of a final review. And if I do, I'm not even sure if it's up, I'll put it on Canvas. I'll take a look though to see what I got. Um, the final will be uh, comprehensive, so it will cover all the chapters, including what we're talking about obviously this week as well. Um, I'm not going to uh, focus probably more on one chapter or the other. So for example, uh, here chapter 10, 11, and 12, we didn't really take an exam or anything on it. So the final will not cover, you know, like 90% this stuff and 10% the other stuff. Probably when it's all said and done, it will probably be pretty evenly spread out over the sort of the big topics we talked about this semester. So that's usually how it ends up. Um, so my intention is not to focus more on one chapter versus something else. So again, everything that you should have known, hopefully throughout the semester, you still should know. And again, it, it'll probably be fairly... I won't say perfectly evenly, but pretty fairly covering a lot of the topics that we talked about. So in reviewing for the final, you definitely want to think back to uh, sort of the big topics we talked about, obviously, in this class, uh, things like nomenclature, conversions, stoichiometry, you know, those are big topics, gas laws, you know, those type of stuff. So uh, Lewis structures. So when you think sort of back on the chapters and the stuff that we talked about, you know, when you, you look at a chapter and you think about, oh, I think we talked about sort of this big topic, you know, those are the things you want to kind of focus uh, in on and stuff like that. Other questions on anything like that? <clears throat> okay, so again, a reminder that uh, chapter 10's lecture was posted last week. So if you haven't looked at it, make sure you do look at it because that stuff obviously will be fair game for the final as well. Um, so make sure you do take a look at it. Other than that, have a good rest of your day. We'll see you on Wednesday for our final lecture of the season. And we'll finish up talking a little bit here about the organic chemistry. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, you too.